Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so I want to talk about five cool things about Haskell. And the reason why I actually wanted to talk about this is because um, despite functional programming having been around for a really long time, I think that the predominant languages we still use are still imperative um, languages. And Haskell is sort of was the last functional programming language that I learned. I started with Scala. Well, I only learned the two. I started with Scala, and then I learned Haskell. Um, and I tried before and failed at learning Haskell. Can I get a quick hands up on who already knows Haskell and who has already programmed in Haskell before? OK. So there are a few folks. OK, so that's good. That's good. Like the majority of everybody here hasn't done it before. OK, now, can I get a hands up on who has tried and failed horribly like myself before? <laughs> okay, so also good, also good, because um, the, the, I'm not actually trying to do a detailed rundown, uh, a deep dive on Haskell today. Um, I'm trying to pique your interest. I'm trying to get you to give it another shot, to, um, to, to go out and, and um, think about some of the things that I'm going to be talking about and how the things which I'm going to be talking about might apply to some of the problems that you have to solve yourself. Right? So, who am I? Um, I'm Stefan. You can reach me on Twitter, BeardPapa. Um, that's also my email if you have any additional questions afterwards. Um, yes? <laughs> um, all right, so thing number one. In Haskell, um, the functions all have a single argument and a single return. So it returns one value and it always takes one argument. Um, there is no function in Haskell that takes more than two arguments ever. There's a clever way that, they, that Haskell gets around it, um, but it's really rather interesting that you can always only take one argument. Now, if you look at the first line there, my func, um, that's a type declaration, a very loose type declaration for a, for a function. In fact, this code won't compile, so please don't type it into a REPL. But it's close enough that you get the idea. Um, what it actually says is that my func has the type um, it's a function that takes one argument, a, something of type a, and returns another value of the same type a. Um, and the a's there are sort of placeholders at the moment because we haven't actually specified the types. They're also called type variables. Um, myfunc2, that's actually two functions. Myfunc2 are two functions that have sort of been chained together. The function, the first function, actually takes a function, which is a function that takes a single argument and returns a single re uh, return. So if you can place brackets around, I don't know if I can. So if I can place brackets around here, then you'd basically have um, two functions, right? Separated by the arrow right here, right? So you have two functions now. This one, this guy here, these are three functions, right? And, they, and it's the same thing again. You have. Um, the, the first function returns this function, takes a single argument, and returns a function. And then the second function takes a single argument a and returns this function. And then the last function just um, takes a single argument and returns a. But this is a consistent pattern in Haskell, and something very important to remember about Haskell is that um, as a pure functional programming language, it's an implementation of something called the lambda calculus. So if you can find a really gentle introduction to lambda calculus, and if you can understand the basics of lambda calculus, um, you would learn a very important and very powerful thing about the computability and the provability of code in a mathematically rigorous way about, um, about, about Haskell. So if you also love mathematics, then, then this should be very appealing to you, the fact that you can write code that's provably correct, and that you can actually write the proof of your code before you actually write the code. Right. So still on thing number one, carrying. So this idea behind how this actually, part of how this actually works, the fact that you can have a single argument um, that returns a single uh, a parameter, um, obviously, in order to be able to compute this, you need the compiler has to, to, make, to do something, right? Um, and that is Haskell by default curries. You have currying by default. So all functions, when you have a function like the one that I just described, which is uh, myfunc2, for example. Um, it's actually currying the, 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 the first parameter, meaning that it returns a function. And then that function then is applied to the 
output of the first application. Um, and if that didn't make sense, um, I'll, re I'll revisit it, or you can ask me in the Q&A what, what that means, um, what function application means, that is. Right, so here is an example of how one would curry something. Again, we have here an actual, so you can actually type this into a, um, into a, 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 a REPL um, or into a command line or even into a, um, into a function, sorry, into a, a module definition, which is that what this will actually allow you to do is now declare, um, this is a type declaration for this function, myfunc, um, and ignore this bit in front here, in front of the rocket. This is sort of a, a, a specialization which just says, which sort of implies, not implies, but specifically states what the type of A should be, because previously we didn't specify the type of A. Now we kind of say, okay, A should be something that is a numeric value um, here. So now we're explicitly declaring the function as uh, like this. When you actually go to the, so this is a type declaration. This, this can't actually be called directly. This is just a contract that you're make, basically making with the environment saying that my func should have this type signature so that when I go and actually implement the function, I can get the compiler to check whether or not there is any sort of mismatch between what I think I want to do and what I am actually doing. Um, and in this case, um, there is, uh, I'm basically saying A plus B, but, I, but A and B are numeric types in this case, and um, the, the plus operator, interestingly enough, is just another function in Haskell as well. It's called the binary associator function, and that's the thing about Haskell. Everything is a function, pretty much. And all the, even the inbuilt operators um, like this. This is an infix operator, um, but it can also be, um, be, be um, used as a, as, a, as a prefix operator. Um, there's a way of doing that, which I asked me about in the, you can ask me about it in the QA. I'm not gonna deep dive because I'll probably run out of time if I do. Now, here, for example, so this is what I wanted to show you. I wanted to show you currying, right? So the function actually um, adds two numbers together, but I can do a partial application of my func, meaning that I can pass in only the first parameter a to the function, and this actually returns another function which takes the one parameter, right? Um, and that's what I, and this, and this is the, the single um, argument, um, single return type at work. I can, it, I can pass in a single argument to this, fu to this uh, function, which will return me the, 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 the the last part of the function, which I can then apply. So if I do, if I apply one to my func, I get a function back, which when I pass it any argument, it will add one to the second argument, and then I'm basically adding two, and then I'm getting three, right? Thing number two, polymorphism. So I kind of hinted at, um, at, at what this num a here was, and why this a here is not actually a, a type um, a, a concrete type like a string or a char or an int. Um, and this bit here before the type, before the hash rocket is called the type class constraint. This is a way of actually um, constraining the type that A might have. This is a type of polymorphism within Haskell. Um, and if we think about the way that we are probably, that most of us have come to learn about polymorphism is probably through object-oriented programming, where you have a um, where you have a superclass or an interface that you define, and then you derive something from it. Um, and this, for me, was something radically different in the way that I had to think about polymorphism, because the polymorphism or the polymorphic behavior um, of functions in Haskell, because there are no objects in the object-oriented sense within Haskell. The way that I had to think about it was radically different from the way that I've come to understand it from the object-oriented imperative um, way of, um, of, of, of working with, with code, um, which is that there are levels of polymorphism within Haskell. Um, one of the levels of polymorphism is, is what you're looking at here, which is uh, type class constraint or uh, I'm game. Sorry, I'm not, I don't want to get it wrong. There are two types. There is a, there's something called ad hoc um, polymorphism, and then it's a second type, which is either, I'm gonna get it wrong. I'm gonna get it wrong. Ad hoc and parametric, but I don't want to say the two are different because 
of the three names of these things, two of them are actually the same, the same thing said differently. But if you want to dig a little deeper, go and check those things out. OK, so here, what I'm doing is um, I'm saying hello funk A, B. And the, the reason why I've actually done this twice was to, um, to, to draw contrast between the first type declaration and the last type declaration here. In the first one, I'm explicitly stating that I actually want a, uh, a type or a type declaration for this function, which um, takes two arguments um, on the function. So the function takes two arguments. And on the second one, I also have a function that takes two arguments. Um, and then, but, but the arguments here are specifically now um, strings. I want to concatenate two strings here, whereas in the previous example, the same myfunc, right, we actually added two numbers together. So I'm using the same myfunc there. Um, and the type for my func there resolves to uh, a num if we actually ask the, the Haskell REPL to tell us what the type is of this thing here. Then it will give this. But we see a similar pattern here, which is that we have hello func as the type. It takes one thing, it takes two parameters, and then returns um, a third one. Or rather, it's a function that returns a function that takes a string or takes, a som takes something as the first two parameters. The interesting thing to note here, for example, and this is the interesting thing about polymorphism within Haskell, is that P1 and P2 are not type constrained. They can actually be anything. Um, they don't have to be um, strings. Whereas in the first example here, because of the way that the plus operator works, um, those parameters actually have to be, um, they don't have to be numbers. Um, they have to be Somewhere there needs to exist a, um, a type class instance of, um, of whatever it is that you're passing in. So let me unpack what I just said a little bit, we, because this is another interesting thing about the way that polymorphism works within Haskell. Um, it's similar to the way if you've worked with Golang, that, that Golang defines interfaces, meaning that you don't explicitly state membership through, um, through derivation. You don't say that um, I'm a member of this interface or I'm a member of this class. Um, you state that I express this behavior in Haskell. So in Haskell, you can think of it as um, I behave in this way. And in object-oriented polymorphism, you can think of I am this kind of a thing. So you have this I am a type of or I I have this behavior, and I behave in this, be in this way, which is two slightly different ways of, um, of, of, of looking at the same thing. And that is, so polymorphism in Haskell then, I behave in a certain way. Polymorphism in, in, in classical object-oriented uh, programs, um, I, I am this thing, right? <coughs> thing number three, pattern matching. Pattern matching is actually an extremely powerful thing in Haskell. Um, if you haven't worked with a language um, that, that has pattern matching built in, it's, it's a very, very powerful thing. Uh, it's something well worth exploring. Um, if you haven't worked with a language like that, doesn't have to be Haskell. Um, try Scala. Scala is a little bit more of a gentle introduction. Um, but pattern ma matching in general um, is, is very interesting. What, what's happening here is that I'm declaring a, um, a function that takes an integer and returns a Boolean value. But the name of this function, I'm actually, um, do, I've got two implementations of the same function here. And this should look weird to you. Because typically what happens when we overload the implementation of a method or a, or a function like this, um, this is an expression of polymorphic behavior, for example, in our classic object-oriented sense, right? This is something similar, but it's resolved through something called pattern matching uh, by the Haskell compiler. Um, what it's actually doing is, when you invoke this method, is it true, when you pass it an argument, whatever that argument is, it'll try to find the method which, clo clo which matches the invocation or the function application. So if you send, if you pass in two, then it looks through the, um, through the list 
um, of, of, of EasyTo's instances and says, oh, there is an EasyTo that actually takes a, a, a number two. I'm going to um, run that function. In this case, we have a very trivial function. The function only returns the true value, right? But there could be a more complex uh, computation over here. Um, and then this is just a special syntax within Haskell, which actually tells us that it um, um, anything else, so it's a catch-all, like a, a wild card, um, that will catch everything else. So for is it two, if you pass in two, it will return true, and if you don't, it will, it will return false. Something which gave me a tremendous amount of headaches when I tried to figure out how to actually do anything useful within Haskell was um, when, I went to, when I went looking for four loops within Haskell and I couldn't find four loops and I couldn't find how you actually iterate over a data structure to consume the data structure and perform any sort of meaningful computation on it. Um, it turns out that I just hadn't done enough reading through the book that I was studying at the time. Um, and this for me is, again, it's a, it's a super important um, um, part of, of um, leveling up your understanding in Haskell is to understand the way in which um, function, or rather pattern matching, applies to, to um, arguments that are passed into functions. So the purpose of this function is actually just to take a string and then um, convert it into uppercase. Um, now I'm going to quickly run through this. Um, sorry, Michael, how am I doing for time? Time oh, that's how much time I've left? Yeah. Okay. Including Q&A? Yeah. All right. Okay. So what the function here is doing is um, it's taking an argument, but you'll notice the argument has sort of got a weird um, shape to it. it. It has x colon xs. Now x is just a, a type uh, a variable, and xs is another type variable. And that colon is a special operator within Haskell. It's called the cons operator. Uh, what the cons operator does is it actually takes the thing on the left and it concatenates it to the thing on the right. Um, uh, more importantly though, um, the thing on the right needs to be something that can be concatenated or prepended to, right? So you're actually prepending the thing on the left to the thing on the right. Um, so the thing on the right, if it is a list, then the thing on the left can't be a list as well. The thing on the left actually has to be a type of the elements that are contained within that list. So if xs in this case, if you're passing in a string here, then you need to prepend a char to the front of it. We are doing the reverse here. We are telling the, co the co compiler, I'm going to pass in a string, split off the first character into the, into the, uh, through pattern matching into the thing on the left, and the rest of the string uh, you split off into the thing on the right. So this is sort of a, an interesting way of, of lobbing off the head of a string, getting the character out, and now you've bound the, 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 the head of the string um, and the tail of the string uh, to the, um, not the head of the string, the tail, but the head and the rest of the string to these two variables which can now be used within the computation that you have. Two upper is a built-in function that we have, um, and we just apply um, two upper to the first character in the string, and then we recursively call um, the, uh, the, the, the same function on the rest of the string. And so you're sort of, you're pac-manning your way through the string, right? You're, you're, you're gobbling up the first character and then um, applying a computation on it, um, taking the last, uh, the, the half, uh, latter part of it and then passing it to the front uh, of the string again and then you're consuming it again by lobbing off the head and then consuming it. So you're sort of consuming the, the string recursively in this, in this way. Um, and then also the other part of pattern matching which we're doing at a different level of, of, of abstraction is to make sure that our function can actually terminate. We have to have an uppercase uh, implementation that says what happens when we run out of things to eat in the string. So in, in that case, we return the empty function, the stack gets unwound, our computation completes, and uppercase returns the, the, the value that it's supposed to do. All right? <coughs> Tail recursion. Um, does everybody know what tail recursion is? Or tail optimization, or tail recursive optimization? All right, okay. I like that enough that there are only a few people who know so now I have something to talk about, okay? <laughs> this for me was a super interesting idea that I first came across in, in Scala and I was very happy to, to, to learn that it also exists in, um, in, in 
um, within, within Haskell. Um, it's something that does not actually exist in languages like JavaScript, um, and there are proposals for actually uh, modifying the language to, to introduce it. It's a super important optimization, especially if you're working on large data sets. Um, and I'll explain um, uh, how it works and why it works. So now that we understand that um, you can consume a, a list of a collection of arbitrary elements uh, recursively in this way, right, through pattern matching on the input by lobbing off the head and then applying some computation on it. Um, as with all programming languages, and um, I saw somebody coding C++ back there. Um, if you've never blown the stack in C++, um, you should try harder. Yes. <laughs> Um, because recursively calling uh, uh, functions within C++, you have to be super, uh, super careful um, about um, stack consumption, especially if you're allocating variables um, uh, uh, locally within the function, because that, all of those local allocations are actually performed on the stack frame of the function that you're using. Um, this is a very inefficient implementation of a recursive call. And the reason for that is because on each successive call of the function, you're creating um, a local intermediary calculation that um, actually has to go onto the stack. So the stack actually grows um, in time O to the N um, as the size of your computation or as the size of your list grows, right? So it's a very expensive computation to do. Ideally, what you would like to do is that you would want the entire stack to be resolved on each call. And, and if you do that, you basically have um, linear um, computational time. Your stack never grows. Your stack basically has, um, grow is the size of the actual computation on, the, on one iteration of the call. And the way that you implement it is this. Now, again, it's not super important to pay attention to the syntax that's going on here, but more important to understand why tail recursion exists and why we are interested in it, especially when we start working with large data sets and we consume large data or large strings, for example. So if you're parsing a very inefficient uh, web website, um, you're trying to, to snarf their data, um, uh, and you think, OK, I'm going to write a cool recursive function call, um, you might either run out of memory if you're in Java um, or you might blow the stack if you are, um, if you are in, in, in something like, like C++. Um, and the way that we do it here is basically by creating a, a function locally within the stack. So the where declaration here just creates uh, where is a keyword which allows us to create a, a, a local um, declaration. In this case, we create a local declaration of the, um, of the function itself within our implementation. Within the body of this function, we create another function. We create, actually create the implementation of our function. And this function completes on each call. Um, and because it completes on each call, um, it actually unwinds the stack on, um, on each call of the, of the, um, of the, the recursion. Thing number five um, is function composition. So function composition, when I saw this, I, I sort of got chills because a few years ago I gave a, a talk um, on, um, on, on, on category theory um, and how to work with categories within Haskell. Um, and I was super surprised and pleasantly surprised to learn that within, um, within Haskell, the syntax for expressing um, functional composition um, is the same syntax that is actually used um, when you are working with categories. That is actually an aside which you should absolutely pay no attention to because I'm not supposed to be talking about category <laughs> theory. <laughs> um, but the, the dot operator is the function composition operator. Um, and it can be read as f composed with g. Um, and then x is the argument that you want to pass into the composed version of this function. What you should think, remember that each computation or each function actually returns a single thing. It returns, a, in this case, it will return a single function. So f composed with g will return a function which you can then apply to x. Um, another way of thinking about it is the way that it's written on the right hand side, which is you first call g with, with x as the argument, and then you use the result of that computation as the input for f. And then you call f and apply um, um, the the you apply f to the result of whatever it is that you have computed with g of x. Um, function composition is uh, a super powerful thing because when you work in a language that has um, 
functions as first class citizens, what you actually end up with is the ability to pass the functions around, to, to mash them together, to create new functions, to use things like currying and partial function application to, um, to deconstruct your computation and really achieve very cool reusability um, and reduce a lot of your, um, of a lot of your um, code, a lot of the overhead with, with writing boilerplate code gets massively reduced simply because you can reliably um, reduce your functions, which brings me to another point that I would like to make about functions and why function composition is important. Within Haskell, because everything is um, immutable, because you can't mutate the state of the variables within the computation, um, you are guaranteed that every computation will return the same result for every input, for every function. Meaning that if a function takes two arguments um, and performs something on them, every time you pass in the same two arguments, that function will return the same result. It's a very important property of, of Haskell. Um, not all languages have this. Uh, most imperative languages um, will actually allow you to, to, to create what are called side effects or to have side effects um, applied to things that are happening in your, in your, in your uh, uh, methods. Um, because of this immutability and because of this guarantee that you have of the function's behavior, we can do things like this, which is to say, um, in the first instance here, there are these two methods. There is one called negate and this one called abs, which calculates the absolute number of, um, of something. And what we're trying to do here um, is actually take this list of numbers and uh, negate all of them. And what we're first going to do is we're going to apply um, absolute, we're going to take the absolute value of them and then we're going to apply the negation on them, which is sort of the same thing as what we did on the right hand side here, right? We, um, we first computed one and then the other. Um, we, can also do the, we can also do it this way. We can um, first, um, so everybody knows what map does, right? Everybody more or less knows what map does? Okay, I'll explain what map does. Uh, the map is a, is a function which actually takes two arguments. It takes, a, um, it takes a function as the first argument and an innumerable list or a, a collection of some sort as the second argument. And then it will take this function and apply a comp computation to each of the elements within that list and then return a list which has the new computed values in it, right? Um, and that's what we're doing here. This is an anonymous function. It's called a lambda, um, um, a lambda function within Haskell. It's written with this syntax. The slash x just means that this function doesn't have a name. It has the first argument x, um, and this is its implementation on the right hand side. So five will be, uh, when this function is applied to the first element, x becomes 5, and then we basically compute the body of the function for, for 5, and then we go on to 3, or to minus 3, and we do the same thing. That's basically how this works, right? Um, it looks a bit intimidating unless you understand the syntax and what map actually is meant to do. But it is, very, it is actually very straightforward. The syntax is much cleaner if you do a composition of negate with, a, with, with absolute function. And here we're doing something additional, which you might want to look further in. This is something called point-free notation. You'll notice here that we are no longer specifying the argument to, um, to the composition. We're not saying here anymore, OK, there's supposed to be an x that's supposed to pass in here. This is something that's taken care of by the compiler for us. The anonymous function that is actually returned here already has the, the, the shape that it actually expects a first argument, so it's not necessary for us to specify um, that there needs to be an argument into whatever it is that's going to get returned here. Um, yeah, so that's my, my thing number five is composition. From composition onwards, right, we, we go into really cool, um, the universe expands from that point forward. Um, um, I deliberately did not um, uh, use the M word within this talk. Um, um, the people who know Haskell know what the M word is. Um, it's normally the thing that, that, that people get hit over the head with about why they shouldn't learn Haskell. It's, uh, there are lots of abstract mathematical concepts that can be done with Haskell, but there are also really cool, simple things that can be done with Haskell. And I'm hoping that through this talk, I was able to sort of pique your interest about the cool, simple things that you, you might want to explore with Haskell. Thank you. Um,
Um, uh, any questions? You have 20 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the M word is uh, monad. <laughs> so um, yeah, there, there are lots of jokes about monads. Um, and so monad, um, functors, uh, applicatives, um, semi, semi groups, monoids. Um, these are higher order abstractions, which can also be thought as design patterns. They're actually mathematical design patterns, which. Um, become extremely, become very easily expressible within Haskell's, um, uh, within Haskell. <laughs>